Hi, I'm Jessica, and when I'm not drinking all the coffee, watching Razorback sports, or hanging out with my family of boys, it's my passion to help elementary music teachers just like you find your unique teaching style. My goal with this podcast is to share helpful tips, strategies, and to give you the motivation you need to gain momentum in your teaching so you can continue being the music teacher rock star you already are. I'm so excited about today's guest, Kristen Poulier. We're talking all about music literacy in a way you've probably never heard before. Kids know how to count rhythms and work on that in music classrooms all the time, but really being able to understand what they're doing and the meaning behind counting the rhythms and putting it together in a visual way is so important. She's been a music educator for over 15 years and is the founder of Note Knacks at notenacks.com, K-N-A-C-K-S. She has a blog, hosts workshops, and you can check out more by heading to her website or clicking the link in my bio. I'm so excited to get started, so let's jump right in. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited about our guest, as you just heard from the podcast um, intro. She is doing amazing things in the world of music education, and I am so excited to have her on the podcast today. So first of all, Kristen, I'm going to um, have you tell us anything about yourself that maybe I didn't say in the intro and tell us maybe where you teach, why you started teaching music or anything else like that that you want people to know. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here, very excited to talk with you today. And I think that what you're doing is fantastic. We hear, <clears throat> excuse me, so much about other, you know, we interview, they interview actors and business people, but very rarely do we hear from music teachers. So this is a fantastic. So thank you for that. But just um, my master's is in early childhood, and I was teaching, learned how to teach reading and writing and math. And uh, did music on the side. And then when I started to apply for jobs there in Boston, Massachusetts, the, the jobs for classrooms were very limited with, you know, stacks and stacks of, um, resumes. And so someone needed a music teacher and they asked me and I said, you know what, this would be fantastic. I've always loved music. And then I fell in love with the field and I've been doing it ever since. So I applied what I learned um, on how to read, on how to teach reading and mathematics, and I've moved it over and uh, used it to teach music literacy. That's amazing. I love that story. I love hearing stories of people who became music teachers, but kind of in a, you know, like a unexpected way or in a different way than, you know, you normally hear of the traditional path. That's awesome. And so I'm so excited today to talk about, that's what we're mainly talking about today is music literacy, because you have so much experience and looking at the, you know, all the things on your website, I can see that. And so first of all, what is your favorite thing about teaching music? The kids. The kids crack me up. The stuff that they come up with. I think we, as teachers, we under as a community, not a, way beyond teachers. I think as a community, we underestimate children, and they come up with these ideas, and you think, I didn't even think of that. What a great idea! And it just builds and builds and builds until you have them reading and composing and creating these amazing works. And it came from them. It's it's you're just a facilitator to help them learn rather than the one with all the knowledge that you bestow upon them. Mm, I love that so much. I mean, kids really, they do, they say the most wittiest, the most wittiest, the wittiest stuff. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, they, we can learn so much from them just as much as they learn from us because they have great ideas and, and you're like, why did I not think of that? But just, mm -hmm. yeah, I know that's happened so many times to me too. I think that's so awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive right into our topic, uh, music literacy. Okay, so you explained a little bit about it, um, a little bit about your experience with math, teaching math and reading, but um, I would love for you to dive into that further. And so tell us a little bit about how, first of all, how did teaching those subjects help you with getting started teaching music? And then I'm going to ask you some more about how you use manipulatives and exploration. Okay, well, when I got to the music classroom, I expected to find manipulatives. The 60s had happened quite some time ago, and I figured <laughs> there had to be music, there had to be block manipulatives. And when they weren't there, I was rather shocked because the way we teach mathematics and literacy in the regular classroom is 
through manipulatives, is through exploration, is through, mm-hmm. <laughs> excuse, me, move, move, excuse me, moving the sentence, you know, the words around to create sentences, moving numbers around to create number sentences, essentially. Um, Unifix cues, grouping and regrouping, straws, that's a big thing now with learning how to understand ones, tens, hundreds. Mm -hmm. And so all of that knowledge that was in my head when I came to teaching, it's a language. Music is a language. And I don't think we necessarily do that in our field. I think that we concentrate, and rightfully so, a lot on the singing and the dancing and, and the creating, which is fantastic. But at the end of the day, kids aren't necessarily coming out with understanding the actual language, being able to read it. And they read these small rhythms, but then applying those rhythms to greater works and then being able to create from those as well, rather than in just short bursts, actually creating full-blown compositions. Mm-hmm the day your regular language arts classroom kids are writing and they start writing immediately in kindergarten they're writing two word stories they're writing um what they did that day or things that they see things that they like to do we need to apply that in the music classroom as well and I felt strongly enough about that 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 has been the path that I've been on for quite some time now (laughs) I love that no I love that so much because I feel like you probably feel this way too, where teaching, you know, the different teaching methods are very important, but for me personally, and I may have stepped on some toes here, but that's what I do. Um, (laughs) I feel like there, and I've talked about this before, there's some very, there's music teachers who heavily focus on ORF or heavily focus on Kadai, but I'm really big on of those methods are great and I'm not saying yes. don't do them but do yes. what works for you and I feel like like you're saying pull from different methods and teach teach music but like you said teach music literacy because I do feel like that's missing as well because think about it when a and you've probably experienced this too when a child starts middle school band or choir or orchestra they go in a lot of times not knowing how to read music. It, it depends on who their elementary music teacher was. Mm-hmm. And, and so I do think it's missing too. And I think it's hard sometimes too, because there's so much expected, whether the principals like do 74 performances this year or, <laughs> or the other objectives you have to teach. So teachers sometimes maybe don't know how to include music literacy in their classroom, in their music classroom time. So how do you find that the best ways to, um, to teach it like what works Uh, for you in your you know what in your experience what's worked for you um first thing I I should mention is that we have very limited time and I do understand that teachers have 30 minutes sometimes 45 and sometimes not even once a week sometimes it's once every nine days or it's for and then they don't see their kids for another year so there are the, all these challenges. And so what I've tried to provide for teachers is a way to teach music literacy in a fun way, but also in little bursts. Let's make this as efficient as possible because they don't have the hour and a half literacy block that you would normally get in a regular classroom. And so I'll just show you the blocks are, you know, I don't think you can, yeah. Uh, whole note is eight inches. You have your half, sorry, the whole note is 16 inches. Your half note is eight inches and so on and so forth. And they're color, see the color, you see the rhythm. Kids can just go ahead and say the rhythm without getting wrapped up. There's a lot of controversy on whether we should use ta and t. And academics are getting really worked up in the ta versus the t because it has to be on the first uh, on the beat or off the beat or to the, you know, the third of the beat, the kids don't care. Kids yeah. do not care. And at the end of the day, like I, I, <laughs> I understand the academia behind it and I commend them for their yeah. thoughtfulness. But at the end of the day, yo, yo ma, when he's playing a piece of music, he's not worrying whether it's a ta or a t. Yes. <laughs> you're exactly right. <laughs> Can he read the rhythm of, oh, you know, that's what yeah. we're getting to do. Can you read the rhythm? And if we had, the hour and a half block, five days a week, that we could really dive into having kids dissect that kind of, dissect these beats, dissect these measures. There's so much more, so much of us, so many of us want to get into with kids. We just don't have time. Let's get them reading, let's get them writing, let's get out of here. Yeah, it's so limited how long you have these kids, I know. 
It's really, it's crazy. So, um, so I'm sorry. So I got off on this tangent. Remind me, what was the question? No, no, you're fine. No, I was saying, how do you, um, with the limited time that you see the kids in music, how do you get them? What are the, what am I trying to ask? What are the best ways, the simplest ways, I guess. So if a new music teacher is listening to this and they're like, well, how do I get started doing this? I don't see my kids very much. And I have all these other things I need to teach. What do you suggest for helping them get started with teaching music literacy? Well, the, the, um, that's really why I came up with the blocks. I came up with the blocks, not to create a company or to sell anything or to, you know, make this big Mm -hmm. company deal. It was really about, I need a way to get to the connect to my kids. who I see once a week in a title one school where they can have fun, have their little hands busy and I can get through it quickly so that I can get to other things like movement and singing. Okay. And let me interrupt real quick. The block she's talking about, look at notenext.com and you'll see these blocks she's referring to. They're awesome. They're color coded. And she has, I mean, developed a system for teaching music literacy and reading rhythms that you need to check out. Okay. So I wanted to Thank plug you that in real so quick. Much. No. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, that's all I was going to say. <laughs> oh, so I was just going to say, so I'll just kind of go through it quickly. Okay. The, yeah. I start with kindergartners and I just talk about length of sound, which I think has really been absent in our music literacy piece of music education, in music education. I think that we go straight to notation instead of talking about this, that, that notation is actually a long sound or a short sound depending mm-hmm. and talking about kids having every sound has a beginning, a sustained middle and an end. So all we're doing in the first weeks of school, even with pre-K or young K's, are creating a sound. Now, at first it was, we start together, we sustain together, we end. But now we've gotten into silly sound. Can you make a silly sound for this amount of time? Can you make a car sound? Can we have animal crossings? So it's really expanded. So kids are really having a good time making all of these sounds, but beginning together, sustaining together, and ending together. Mm -hmm. Talk about sound down on paper. If I want to remember these sounds tomorrow, how am I going to do it? trace them, color it in. In fact, I have behind me just a, just sort of an overview. I don't think you, I don't know that you're going to be able to see that. You're going to be able to see that. Okay. So trace the blocks essentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, They trace the blocks. And so now they have a notate, they have notation down on paper. So all of these activities, like the, the animal crossings can take you the first 10 minutes of class boom move on you know it's not something that you do for 45 minutes every single class it's something that you can interject little games of hey let's come up with a crazy sound today just for this or they use whip block and then you move on and you do whatever else you need to do so you can do it for that amount of time or you can make it really long and have a three you know three sound five sound ten sound composition where all they're doing is animal sounds or silly sounds whatever you want to do and they can change the sound. So the first sound might be a, actually the notation side, but the first note, first sound might be a, an elephant, but the second sound might be a monkey, you know, that kind of thing. And then from there we go, we use the color system, red, red, yellow, red. Again, they trace the blocks. I want them tracing so that they start to see the relationships vertically. That's another thing I think we're missing in music literacy, that no matter the time signature, Two quarters are always going to equal a half. Two halves are always going to equal a whole. So I know I you talk about going against tradition. I go way against tradition. <laughs> I My kids are learning terracottas right off the bat, 16th notes. And that's not to say that they're doing um, syncopated rhythms yeah. or yeah. they are necessarily tapping them correctly. We're just, it's all exploration. We're all learning about it all together. Right. And it preps them. It's pre-reading when they're doing something like this. it's prepping them for this um for for syncopation later on but they're really getting a handle on the the length that those lengths matter yeah that's good when we do get to um time signatures later on 516 isn't going to crack is not going to make them crazy because we've been sort of dealing with that the whole time Mm -hmm. the patterns i want them to see patterns you know what does that five mean what does that 16 mean um anyway so from there they trace them they colored in then it's red red yellow red blue yellow red gray terracotta yellow red trace them and then from there they just extract the notes because inevitably on a frame because i have these little handy dandy frames 
that look like this. And they're all, again, mathematically proportional. So um, they create, trace it, color it in, and then the next, the conventional notation is they just write that half note. And inevitably, you're going to have some kid do this where it's a rest. Oh, that's interesting. What's the difference between this front side and this back side? What's that all about? Yeah. And then it, it naturally goes into what a rest is versus um, a sound because so often kids think a rest is like for an infinite amount of time. They don't realize that it's, it's, it's finite. That sound, that length of silence is finite. We have a, it has a specific place in the measure and not this does. So. Yeah, I love that. I love because kids are, well, not all kids, but, you know, some kids are visual learners. And mm -hmm. so they're using a visual to represent what the rhythms look like. And so like in the tracing and having them, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Be proactive in the classroom. So they're able to not just listen to you teach it or just sing it or just talk about it. But not only, and they're not just visualizing it, but they have it in front of them and they're able to trace it and talk about it with you and learn it that way. I think that's great. And it's kinesthetic. The kids are really, you know, they're touching it and they're moving it around. So um, to get back to the, we don't have that much amount of time, because that's really the big problem in, in music classrooms is you can give kids frames, you can have it all set up. They create a rhythm, they say it, boom, you move on to the next thing. So it's all these little interjected games or activities that you can put wherever you want in your class plan and your lesson plans for the day to really get through it easily and quickly and move on. That's and, awesome. That's and awesome. the other piece of it was that the older kids, you don't want middle schoolers saying ta's and t's, or you might want to, but that's a whole other slew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when they see the colors, they say the rhythm, it's not babyish, they move on and you can get it done quickly with the older kids. Yeah. Those being students. Yeah. Well, I think what's cool too, I was thinking this, whenever you do introduce us like a new song, I'm sure the students are able to see a rhythm that they may be like, oh, wait a second. Wait, we just did this pattern or I, I remember this. Oh, wait, is this a whole rest? And then they're, they're getting excited about seeing it. Does that happen to you a lot? That happens to a certain extent. And the other th major thing that happens, which I didn't, there are a couple of things that, that sort of came out of this that I didn't expect. One is that when they create, when they do write the notation, you can see that mm -hmm. it's all bunched in the front because the frames allow them, they understand it's a length of time. It's, it's that way. And the other thing was, um, Younger kids, first graders and second, first graders in a Title I school in a very poor neighborhood here in Georgia, having a really tough time, were able to read all the note all standard notation in standard rhythms, not syncopated yet, you know, syncopation yet or anything, but standard rhythms. They're looking at me like, why wouldn't I be able to re read this? Of course I can read this. Yeah. The colors make it easy. Because the thing is, is that in our system, we say that. We shouldn't be teaching, we shouldn't be teaching 16th notes until third grade. But some of the kids' names have, they're learning syllables, they're learning four syllable words, their names have four syllables and they're clapping those syllables out. So they're doing the prep work anyway, mm -hmm. making it a little bit further. And mm -hmm. some kids can, and that's differentiated instruction. Yeah, yeah, and so I can see this also. Do you do, um this just came to my mind, but do you do poet, any poetry in your classroom that, where it relates to, they learn the rhythm and then, hey, look, this has rhythms in this poetry as well. No, but what a fantastic idea. <laughs> That's just what it brought me. To oh. me but, you know, but speaking of reading in their classrooms, I don't think, um, when we talk about music, ad, ad, why can I say that word? Advocacy. Music, learning music and learning to read music ties so much into reading as well as math. When they're learning to count rhythms and note length, and I mean, that goes right into reading, you know, because stories, you have to take a breath and you have to um, read certain lines. You have to know how long a paragraph is and, you know, the fluctuation of your voice. And I don't know. I just, and the, every word has different rhythm patterns. And so... I think you even explaining this, which you probably maybe have before, but do regular classroom teachers 
like, hey, listen, the kids in music are learning this. And guess what? It's helping translate what they're learning into reading. I think that's amazing. So, yeah. I just Good connection. No, thank you for the idea. I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So blog <laughs> post coming on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I always get ideas like that. I'm sure every teacher does. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> but yeah. So okay. So to change um change course a little bit, when it comes to curriculum, do you have any advice for elementary music teachers who feel stuck in making a choice or don't have a lot of resources at their disposal? Um get as much as you can read as much as you can in a wide variety, you know, whatever, wherever you find, um, as different as you can. I think that because the wharf levels and the Kodai levels can get pricey. I understand that. And it's not like we're pulling in, you know, exorbitant amounts of money to be able to do this. So mm-hmm. more, there are a lot of resources online. There's a lot of resources on YouTube. There are, you know, books that, I think that aren't necessarily hugely expensive, but if you go to the trade, your, your state's trade show, people are having specials. Um, those sessions are super beneficial. They can be expensive to go to, but they're so um, beneficial and resources like what you offer, what I offer. I would, um, you, you have a course on your website, which I think is fantastic. I, I'm going to have to steal that idea. I think that's a, fantastic idea um offering courses and readings and just yeah the place and also I branched out into because of my background I'm not just reading music material I'm also reading uh materials from Reggio Emilia which is a um I don't know if you've heard of it it's early elementary actually it's young very young childhood uh, philosophy on how to teach children through exploration and setting up provocations and these activities for kids so that they can discover things and write things down. And I pulled from there, I pulled from Montessori, I pulled from a violin teacher that um, born off, he was a violin teacher out of Canada and created a method. And I fell in love with it because his philosophy was, and this is my point about 16th notes, teach it all when it's all hard. Mm-hmm. it's all hard anyway so why not just teach it all at the beginning and then you can start differentiating you can start uh branching off from that so those are the three main philosophies i've pulled from to create this methodology but you never know when you're going to get inspiration yeah i think that's great i really do because it's sometimes the workshops i've attended or this you know the different teachers I've listened to but I'm like oh I'm not going to get much from this and then I'm like oh my gosh it just kind of just gives me an idea or a new way of doing things that I didn't think of before and so I think like you exactly. keep your ears open and you know always find resources be looking and being open to learning and I think it's going to just help I think as new teachers get in the classroom too is when they discover their teaching style it just takes a while it just takes you know just getting in and doing it is honestly yeah. you learn the most I mean honestly that's where I learn the most it's just I'm in here by myself um no more you know no more student teaching mentor teacher no no one's around me okay I gotta just do this <laughs> that's the joke is always the first five years are yes you can do that no never mind you can't do that no, no, bad idea bad idea yeah. what did I do this isn't what I thought it was gonna be like oh my gosh there's so many thoughts going ahead. um so when going through music curriculum what choices do you feel are lacking but we talked about already a lot of the musical notation and things like that mm-hmm. it's I think that That's really my biggest thing. My other pet peeve is not teaching 16th notes separate. And I don't mean, I do not mean uh, syncopation, but showing kids before they, before they learn the barred notes that they need to know that these, put them together by all means. This is a yellow. These are eighth notes that you need to put together, but show the flags before you sure show the icon um, as a barred note, because I think kids still think that's one sound because it's one block or one icon. Ooh, that's good. I never thought yeah. about that. You know, show, show them the long hand. It's not like we, le- we don't learn division before we learn uh, multiplication. We don't learn multiplication before we learn addition. Mm-hmm. Reason for that. And this is that reason. 
Um, it's the same kind of thing. But other than that, I think pe- teachers are just fighting for their lives, trying to get as much of the standards covered and, s- and not only the little time that we're given, but the lack of respect that we are given with e- even within the educational community, which is already filled with lack of respect. Mm-hmm. And teachers pulling kids and field trips and things like that. You know, the big joke on Facebook is, you know, teachers are like, snow day, snow day. Teachers are like, our music teachers are the only ones going, no, no, no. I- three weeks I've got work to do you know yes so I think that that we're all just trying to get it done and that's part of this too is really time how can you get as much time out of your day or out of your period that you see them as possible that's good oh that's good advice no I really do think Everything you just said is very relevant, and I think that's amazing. I never really even thought about the showing the students, you know. I mean, that's just, I feel like what a lot of elementary music teachers do, just because that's what you've seen done, is showing them the eighth notes or 16th notes with just the bar, but not really individually. So students probably just think, oh, you count that PT, not individual note. And I think that's, man, that's exactly, that's true. (laughs) I've been guilty as well, yeah. They're not understanding that it's the note head that matters, not the stems. Because the only reason why we bar them is to read them in an easier way. It's not, it doesn't affect the music at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do all Bach, can you imagine? But all Bach in (laughs) individual and 16th notes, you'd you'd get a little crazy, but it wouldn't change the music. Mm -hmm. That's good. No, that's good. So what is something you enjoy doing with your students where they get to use their creativity? sound just making crazy sounds and yeah, that's good and and letting them improvise on any instruments or with their voice as much as possible mm-hmm. giving them full reign and giving them a long period of time to do that within a context yeah that's good so you said improvising so that leads me into my next question which is how do you encourage them to compose music together and have you found this has gone well for you Yes, and interesting enough, it depends. Some of it depends on who the environment of the school and the environment of the their classroom teacher. Mm. Um, traditional way of teaching is sit down, be quiet. I'm going to shove a bunch of stuff down your throat. You have to throw it back up to me on a test, and then all's well in the world. And I'm certainly not blaming regular classroom teachers because they're under the gun just as much as the rest of us for these test scores and mm-hmm. a whole other, you know. Con- yeah. And, and, and conversation, but um, getting them to play their instruments or an instrument or getting them to compose at first, it's very rote. At first, it's just use, you know, they're putting red, yellow, red, yellow, and they're mixing those around. There's no rhyme or reason to it. They're not to, trying to really create anything per se. They're just moving the blocks around. And then we start getting into, okay, let's start pushing it a little bit further, Um for instance, you know, what would a mouse sound like? If we wanted to create sounds for a mouse on the 4-4, four, four, where is it? On the 4-4 four, four frame, we have this much space to show what a mouse would sound like. Would there be a lot of short sounds? Would there be a lot of long sounds? Would it be a gray? Would that sound like a mouse? No, no, no. It's more, you know, scurrying. Mm-hmm. Sounds. Okay, well, how, what kind of shorts? Yellow short sounds? Ter- terracotta. Okay, let's put terracotta. And there's just a couple. And then, yes, we can put a couple. And then it sits, the, the mouse sits down for a while. Okay, well, what's that going to sound like? Oh, that might be a red. So terracotta red, or terracotta, terracotta red, terracotta. And then it runs off again. Now the cat's chasing them. Oh my gosh, what are we going to? And so creating a story around their compositions. That's so good. You know, it starts getting the juices flowing. That and Many music teachers, I think, are are fantastic in the sense that they will, you're awesome anyway, but in telling our kids that it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, play, you know, play your recorder. We do this, um, you know, you have a count of eight to improvise. I did it with a concert, uh, the just my this past spring concert, and they had only been improvising like a, you know, two, three classes, but they did it in front of a full-blown audience, although you had one kid going, Wait, we're doing this in front of people? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> we're not doing that. But for the most part, it's you can't make a mistake. Do the best you can. You're awesome. And they do. They rise to the occasion. If you let them know that the world's not going to blow up if you hit a wrong note, because there is no wrong notes because you're improvising, all's well in the world. And I love the way you teach the composing. I feel like 
a lot of times there's a here's staff paper or here's a I don't know whatever technology iPad and then there's so many great composing apps out there right yeah. so many, you know but I feel like a lot of times teachers get stuck with teaching composing because they feel like they have to do it so formally where it's okay you have 16 measures I want four beats in each measure create a rhythm and then the kids look at you like what but yeah. I mean, coming at it, like you said, making it fun and interesting and talking about it, creating a story behind it. I think that is such a great idea. And the kids they enjoy it probably, right? Yeah, it's really fun. And letting them do what they're going to do. Because and ultimately, the kids are going to build with the blocks, right? Things like this. You know, any anything you can get from them, they're building with the blocks. Great. We have three new compositions. Mm. So now this, I can do it. I don't know if I can do it, but that, you know, that's a composition now. Yellow, red, or is it red, yellow? Which way do you want to do it? You know, any way we can pull from the kids, anything we can get from them. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I want to ask, what advice do you have for elementary music teachers who are intimidated by composing with their students? You know, it's really funny. It's funny that you asked that because I, I, I don't know if you've ever, you know, you've led a session and with teachers and they get mad at their kids for not raising their hands or not participating. Yes. <laughs> the teachers are going like this. <laughs> they get mad at your kids anymore. Um, I would say you're in that room by yourself. No one else is in there. I, I tend to kick the aides out to a certain extent because it allows me, it allows the kids to have a little more creativity as much as you can. Yeah. Some, some of them can't be kicked out and that's fine, but it's you and the kids. It's always just you and the kids. Block everything else out. And they think you're, you know, you, you've developed this relationship with them. You just, you have to go fearless into the future. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it. You just, and, and you're going to mess up. And you know what? The, it's really beneficial for kids to see you mess up. I think that we forget that we can't always be the know everything person. Because A, we don't know everything. And B, it gives kids permission to say, oh, I don't, miss, I don't need to know everything. I don't have to create a perfect thing. It's okay if I mess around a little, let's see what happens. And I'll say to kids, I'm just taking this out for a spin. I want to see how far I can push you. Don't worry about it. If you don't know it, don't worry about it. But let's see how far we can go with this. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And letting kids know it's okay to make mistakes. I feel like kids too are so hard on themselves, just like we are as teachers, where they feel like they have to do everything right, everything perfect. And oh my gosh, I didn't have the right, you know, um, amount of beats in that measure or whatever. But just, it's okay. Just the whole goal is to try and to mm -hmm. get started doing it. And it's okay if it doesn't, if you're teaching kids composing and it's new to you, it's okay if it doesn't look like the teacher down the street because it's your classroom. So exactly. make it your own. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I want to close out today. I like to close out each episode by asking you, what is one piece of advice you wish someone had told you before you started teaching ele elementary music? Oh, wow. I know it's a big one. <laughs> um... I don't know if there, let's see. I have to think. Or if there's more than one, that's okay too. Things like the, um, to join groups to make sure that you connect with other music teachers because you're going to feel isolated mm -hmm. because there aren't necessarily other music teachers in your, your class, in your school. Uh, and along those lines, you are going to be required to go to professional development that is absolutely and completely irrelevant to anything that you do. Oh, man. <laughs> all, the, all the testing meetings, you're sitting yep. there like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yep. Data. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that, that would be the, that would be, and that that's okay, that you, you're going to need to find your own outlet you're going to need to find your own connections within the community of music teachers within a system so if you're in a school district connect with the other teachers at those meetings because those are the connections that are going to be that are going to help you survive thank you so much for listening in to the elementary music teacher podcast be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode and while you're there i would love for you to review the show and leave a rating on itunes
To find out more about how I can help you gain momentum in your elementary music teaching career, head to thedomesticmusician.com where you'll find free downloads, courses, the blog, and so much more. Continue teaching music and never doubt the impact you're making each and every day in the lives of your students.